A man would leave an AA meeting, pick up some milk, and head home. Except, he never got home. He has never been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of AJ Bro. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in the town of Homa, Louisiana. At the time, it was a town of about 30 to 35,000 people. It was, and I assume still is, kind of in the middle of Cajun country, surrounded by the backwater bayous, just a very homey type place. Homa, Louisiana is where 50-year-old A.J. Bro called his home. It was his home for his entire life. A.J. was a salesman at the Earl Williams Clothing Store. He was a father to three adult children, and he had been married for quite some time. He and his wife uh, had a great you know, relationship. They raised the three kids to be really wonderful people. And for a while, it was this kind of big, happy family. But unfortunately, AJ kind of fell into alcohol. He became an alcoholic. That would create issues in the marriage, which eventually would cause the marriage to kind of just crumble. And it fell apart. And they ended up getting a divorce. It actually got so bad for AJ that he had been pulled over and arrested for drunk driving. And it was that that was really kind of the wake up call for him. Fast forwarding to 1991, AJ had been a recovering alcoholic for eight years. He was very, very proud of himself that he was able to pull himself out of the depths of alcoholism and... He went to AA meetings religiously. He got to a point where he himself became a sponsor to other, you know, newer members of the AA club that he attended. I guess it was called the Easy Does It Club, and it was really held, I guess, in this just old barn type building. And AJ was a really highly respected member of this group. Everybody loved him. You could tell that AJ was so happy with where, how far he had come because he had hit rock bottom and he worked his way back up and he was now in a really, really good place. He has, uh, you know, established a really great friendship and fathership with his three children. He and his ex-wife, even though they're divorced, they remained really friendly with each other. AJ once again became a, uh, a staple in the community. Uh, he was uh, con you know, continuing to work at the clothing store. He was incredibly dependable, reliable, that if somebody needed help, AJ was the first person to raise his hand and offer help. I think the, the AA stuff, like the support meetings, really kind of helped him become, you know, the person that he eventually became. And most importantly, he was a fantastic dad. His daughters absolutely adored him. As a matter of fact, he was living with one of them at the time this case occurred. And the daughter he lived with would say that, you know, her dad, AJ, became more of a friend to people because he opened up more because of his uh, AA meetings. He was more welcoming and he developed a lot of, you know, good friendships. He became trustworthy once again. And then one day, just suddenly, he's gone. It was August 28th, 1991. AJ had attended his AA meeting at the club. After everyone left, he stayed behind and he helped the group clean up, tidy up, get everything nice and organized. He was in great spirits. He was observed leaving the club at approximately 8.30 p.m. About 30 minutes later, he was observed in the Time Saver convenience store, which was located on Barrow Street. AJ walked in, he purchased a quart of milk, he brought it up to the counter. The uh, cashier remembers, you know, seeing him and how AJ was friendly. He kind of, you know, joked about how expensive the milk was getting and he paid for his stuff and he left and he smiled and he seemed to be, again, in really good spirits. The plan from there was he was going to head back to the home or the apartment he shared with one of his daughters, but AJ never got there. AJ has never been seen again. His daughter became immediately concerned when he hadn't come home that night, but she gave it to the following day just to make sure, you know, maybe he slept somewhere else, who knows. But by that following, you know, morning and afternoon, he still wasn't there, no sign of him anywhere. She reported him missing. A couple of days goes by, and at the 
Jimboe Park, which was, I guess, across the street from where the AA club was, they found his car. The car was seemingly abandoned. The car was locked. They looked in the windows. His daughters there at that point found the car and they looked inside the windows. They didn't see anything abnormal, no signs of foul play, no blood. There's no broken windows. Everything seemed okay, except the fact that AJ wasn't there. So they contact the police. The police arrive, and they're, at that point, the daughters are freaking out because, like, they just had this gut feeling that their dad was in the trunk of the car. Like, that's just kind of where they went to uh, mentally. But they were able to open the trunk, and AJ was not in there. Again, no blood, no signs of a struggle anywhere in the car. Uh, his wallet was found tucked underneath, I guess, the seat. The money was still in it. They also found the, I guess, the AA meeting club funds. Uh, I guess he had an envelope full of cash from it that he would normally, I guess, deposit. Uh, but that was found in the car out in the open, so it wasn't stolen. They had his checkbooks and also the AA club's checkbooks because he ran that part of it also in the car. Nothing appeared to have been ripped out or anything like that. They checked his financials. There hadn't been any bank activity in his account. They also searched the park. They searched it thoroughly. They would dredge the, the nearby waters and the, and the bayou and all that. They found nothing. They found no sign of him. It had rained over that couple of days before they found the car. And so a lot of forensic evidence that may have been on the outside of it was probably washed away. Another aspect of AJ's life was that he had recently come out as being gay. He had finally come out to his ex-wife and his daughters and everyone was really accepting of it. I mean, they were all, they loved him dearly. Uh, you know, in the 90s, it was obviously a much, much different time. Coming out in the 90s could be a very, very scary thing to do. So there was that kind of thing in the back of everyone's minds, like, was this something related to that? Did somebody, did somebody find out and do something to him? A violent altercation? Was this a hate crime? What? You know, it, it was just sort of there. Like, they kind of had that thought of that could be the reason why he's gone. But they had no evidence of that because they had no evidence of where AJ even was. On August 30th, which was the day the car was found, a, a very close friend of AJ, uh, the friend's name was Kenneth. Kenneth went to, I guess, a local convenience store or a gas station. And as he was walking up to it, he saw who he pretty much knew was AJ. He was all out there talking on a payphone outside of the gas station. What was unusual was that AJ had his, his hair was disheveled. He was wearing like this checkered flannel shirt, really baggy pants and some dirty sneakers. AJ was not known. And, you know, the, the friend was like, that's not what AJ would normally wear. AJ was normally dressed up nice and neat. Everything was pristine. His hair was always really well done. He always wore nice shoes. So this was out of sorts. But the friend says, hey, AJ, how's it going? AJ just responds with, it's okay. And that's it. He wouldn't say anything else. It looked to him as if AJ was talking on the phone, but like also looking at someone out by the parking area. And the friend turned and saw this little red sports car. There were three men in it and they appeared to kind of be honing in on AJ. The friend didn't know if that had anything to do with one another, but it just seemed odd to him. The friend goes into the store, comes out several minutes later, AJ is gone, and so is the red sports car, gone. At that time, it wasn't widely reported that AJ was missing. So even though he was missing at that point when that, that sighting was, he, the friend didn't know that. So he didn't really think anything to go to police with it. So when he finds out that AJ is missing, he contacts the police and gives him the sighting. Around that same time, I think it was like the same day, another person calls police to say that he also saw AJ around that same time frame. Uh, driving in a in a red sports car down this rural road where the guy lives, the witness lives. The witness knows AJ really well. AJ sitting in the back seat, and AJ kind of makes eye contact with the guy because he's out there getting his mail. And the the friend waves at him. AJ does nothing. He doesn't say hi. Doesn't wave or anything. And the car just keeps on going. But again, it was the same red sports car with three men in it. The two friends uh, had not spoken to each other, so this was two different sightings around the same day that they both go to police around that same time with the same situation. Both men knew AJ really well. They knew what he looked like. However, this didn't help police locate him. Uh, they didn't have a license plate number. They had a very generic description of this red sports car because, you know, no one thought to like make a observation of, you know, the make, the model, all of that uh, because they didn't know he was missing. They didn't know they should be remembering this stuff. About two weeks after he goes missing, police receive a, a note in the mail. They open it up and the note says, quote, AJ bro, he was drunk at the time, self-inflicted gunshot wound, stomach. 
drawstring cotton sack, put in by friend, rolled over steep grassy bayou bank near dam. And then the note was signed, Helene. So where AJ's car was found was next to a bayou. And it was the same bayou that police had already searched, but they send people back out there. They do a more thorough search of the area. They comb that entire thing top to bottom with divers and everything. They find no sign of AJ, nothing. They find no trace of him whatsoever. But it sounds like this note is trying to imply that AJ is dead and that he got drunk and he shot himself in the stomach on accident. But then somebody else, instead of reporting it to police or you know calling anyone for help, they just put him in a sack and rolled him into a bayou and disposed of him. It seemed really odd. On September 28th, four weeks after his disappearance, another woman comes forward to say that she thinks she saw AJ. This sighting was in Lockport, Louisiana. So um, she's sitting outside on her porch, um, just you know, enjoying the day, and a van kind of goes up and down the street a few times. The van, you know, the guy driving the van stops it in front of her house. He then gets out of the car, walks up to her with this bag of frozen fish, and asks if she wanted to buy any. Um, she said no, uh, and she would later say that you know she smelled a lot of alcohol coming off of his from his breath. And he said, "Okay, thank you." Anyway, he turned around, begins to walk back towards the van. He then turns back around and give her gives her just like a friendly glance uh, and smiles, and then he gets back into his van and takes off. It's a few minutes later when she realizes that she thinks she saw that man's photo in a newspaper about a missing person, and so she looks at the newspaper and says, "Oh my God, that's the guy I just saw." So she goes to police. Police have her look at a couple photos of AJ, and she confirms that that's the man I saw. He was disheveled. He appeared to be drunk. He looked homeless. But it never brought police to find him. Like, it never... It was a tip. It was a lead, a possible sighting, but it didn't lead to actually finding him. Because at that point, he was already gone. A lot of people are confused by these sightings because... Uh, these sightings has him looking very disheveled and, and drunk and he had been in recovery for eight years and why all of a sudden did he just fall off the wagon if these sightings are are true and why would he just start drinking all of a sudden and then pick up and leave town and then kind of pop up from time to time around town like it didn't make any sense to people plus his wallet and everything his belongings were all in the car all of his belongings were left at home. Why would you not bring his wallet? Why would you not bring anything? Cash, nothing. His bank accounts have never been touched. His social security number has never been used. There have been no more sightings of him. And this is, his story was on the news, like in throughout all of Louisiana. It also appeared at one point in Unsolved Mysteries. And so his image is out there for the entire nation to see, but no more sightings of him ever came in. Police have no evidence of foul play. They do have one possible exception. There was a story that a guy came forward that at the same park that AJ's car was found, they saw a man, he didn't know if it was AJ or not, talking to three other men who were in a white car. And that appeared that these three men almost forced this other man to get into that car and they took off, leaving the car behind, the other guy's car. It wasn't jiving with the rest of the stories I heard about this red sports car. Sure, they could have switched cars, of course, but it was three men. Uh, but the guy didn't get a good enough look to know if it was AJ or not. They just said it was, he was near where AJ's car was later found. But it didn't, it just, it, I guess that story to police seemed a little sketchy. Didn't They couldn't really corroborate most of it. But they have no sign no evidence of actual foul play. They also have no evidence or any signs that he picked up and left on his own. They are left right in the middle. They have no evidence of either way. With it being so many years later and there have been no more sightings of him, no one has ever come forward, there is that belief that something did happen to him. But what that something is, nobody knows. There is that angle of, because he had recently come out as gay, there is that possibility that he might have met with foul play. He might have gotten some kind of altercation with regards to it, something. It's just a theory. They don't really know for sure, though. In 1998, um, AJ's daughters had him officially legally declared dead. The, the courts agreed with it. And then in 2006, there was a serial killer named Ronald Dominique. And this was a man who targeted specifically gay men in Louisiana. The majority of the gay men he murdered were either homeless gay men or like vagrants, which could kind of also fit because people 
who saw AJ after the disappearance said he looked like he was homeless. Could have been perceived that way by this serial killer. But Ronald Dominique's uh, serial killing spree didn't even start until 1997. And so the time frame wasn't lining up. That doesn't mean he didn't start you know, years prior, and then kind of took a break, like, oh my god, you know, I gotta, what am I doing? And then went back into it, you know? It's possible, but they've also have no evidence that this guy had anything to do with AJ's disappearance. It's really, again, just a theory. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to AJ bro, and perhaps that someone is you. His family, his daughters, just want him home. In whatever capacity that may be, they just need that peace of mind. They need the answers. This case is now, from what it looks like, being handled by the FBI. So if you have any information on the whereabouts of AJ Bro, please contact your local FBI office as soon as possible. Please help bring AJ home. And if AJ deserves justice, if he met with foul play, please help AJ and his daughters get him the justice he rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe if you're new to the channel. The light's blinking at me and my battery's dying. So please subscribe if you're new here. I tell true crime stories. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. The link to my TikTok is in the description of this video below in the link tree. The link tree also has my case list. Check through it if you want to. It's alphabetical. It's 6,500 names long. If there's a case you want me to cover and it's not on that list, send me a really quick email. The email is listed below as well. Just the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened. Uh, and I'll add that name to my list. I pick the cases I cover each time at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually, I promise. But that is it for this uh, this video, True Crime Runes. So until the next case, ta-ta for now.